Hello everybody, my name is Cody Brave and guys yet another video, and in today's video, well, it's time to continue this little thing of the tier list for the D&D 5e subclasses. Last week, we had went over the Druid subclasses, at least three of them, going over the Circle of Dreams, Circle of Land, and Circle of Stars, which does not exist, but if it did, I don't remember if I did say that it was all the way up here at S tier, but if I didn't, then I kind of thought it over and I read it a little bit more, and also going over what the land gave. I definitely would put stars just a little bit above dreams. Dreams is still extremely great, and I could definitely, you know, there's an easy case to make it an S tier, but at the moment, I'm kind of putting Circle of Stars just a little bit higher because there's a bit more uh, variation to it, and it's got a kind of, you know, the interesting little pieces here and there that can definitely help out in more ways than just what the dream can do. Um, but doesn't mean that dreams, you know, any worse. It definitely is like an 89 versus like a 92 style thing where, you know, just a little bit better. And, you know, if the dream had just that one little extra piece, then I would put it up. But regardless, it is still extremely good. And the Circle of Wildfire definitely is also, you know, like right either a little bit, you know, definitely like a lower on the on the B, you know, like the 82 B minus range. Because while yes, it's good. It definitely has more of like the like more niche areas where it's usable, and uh, not everything is going to be constantly in use and constantly able to be uh, pushed to its greatest. But it still is an extremely good subclass for what it does. And then Circle of Land, it all depends on which land you choose and what type of campaign you're in. So, uh, yep. But now we're gonna go over the last three, I believe. Yep. Circle of the Moon, Circle of the Shepherd, and Circle of Spores, all three of which are actually on here. So, we'll start with Circle of the Moon. Right off the bat, you'll get Combat Wild Shape at 2nd level. When you choose this circle at 2nd level, you gain the ability to use Wild Shape on your turn as a bonus action rather than an action. Additionally, while you are transformed by Wild Shape, you can use bonus action to expend one spell slot to regain 1d8 hit points per level of the spell slot expended. So, this part is kind of whatever, because I don't know if there's really ever a time where you're going to be so needing to be in Wild Shape that you're willing to use a spell slot rather than just saving them for when you're outside of Wild Shape to use an actual spell. But getting to use a bonus action instead of an action means that on your turn, you can use a spell and then turn into a Wild Shape, which is pretty powerful as it allows you to do just a bit more uh, actions and actual strength to yourself rather than uh, either I do it now or I do it later. You can do it now and like you can use both uh, of what you want to do rather than either or. Or if you want, you can bone, you can turn into the wild shape and then attack on the same turn as the wild shape as the whatever you have turned it into. So it's actually a, a very helpful ability to be able to do this as a bonus action instead of an action. Uh, you'll also get circle forms. I'm gonna pop all these up. Circle forms. The rights of your circle grant you the ability to transform into more dangerous animal forms. Starting at second level, you can use your wild shape to transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as one. You ignore the max CR column of the beast shapes table, but must abide by the other limitations there. Starting at sixth level, you can transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as your druid level divided by three, rounded down. So. By the end of things, you're getting all the way up to level, like level six CR, six and a half CR rating that you can actually fight as. Which, the fact that you could transform into a higher rated beast in different shapes and stuff is extremely good. Because you know, if I were, if I were to have the actual table up to show you what all you could turn into, there are some very high. Like, very, very strong things that you can turn into that are, you know, you get into second level forms at 6th level, at, you know, ninth level, at level 9, all the way until your level 6 levels at Archdruid level 20. You get some very powerful things that you can turn into as a bonus action and then do whatever they that shape can do as an action. There are some things that can, as an action, be able to do a multi-attack and different things like that. So as your beast form, you can actually get some really strong things just because you're able to go into a bonus action, attack on the same turn, and be a higher level beast compared to what other druids can do. 
So if you're a really big fan of the beast shape, this one is definitely going towards what you would want to do. Uh, also at 6th at six level, you'll get Primal Strike. Your attacks in beast form count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magical attacks and damage. That's always beneficial when you can be counted as magical so that you can ignore non-magical things, which definitely when you start getting into the higher levels, that's going to be very common, is enemies who are resistant to non-magical uh, non piercing, slashing, and bludgeoning damage. So getting to become immune at 6th level, or ignore that because you're magical, is actually very helpful. You also will get circle forms. The rest of your circle grants you the ability to transform into more dangerous animals. Starting at 6th level, you can transform into a beast with a challenge rating as high as your druid level divided by 3 rounded down, which is just what it was saying here. It's saying that once you get to 6th level, you'll be able to start doing it at uh, divided by 3 rounded down. So, kind of knew you are going to get that, but it's called circle forms if you were wondering. And at 10th level, you'll get Elemental Wild Shape. Let me make sure that this is, yep, you're getting something at 10th level. So you get Elemental Wild Shape, which means that you can expend two uses of Wild Shape at the same time to transform into an Air, Earth, Fire, or Water Elemental. So instead of just always turning into a beast, you know, just turning into a bear, or turning into a, a mountain lion, or anything like that, you can just become an Earth Elemental and get all the benefits of what an Earth Elemental can get. If you're fighting something that, you know, is more beneficial for you to be able to have flight, you can turn into an air elemental. Fire elemental has very beneficial things. Each one also has, you know, nifty little, not spells, but like, I guess, passive abilities in a sense. You can get as each one, you have to look at what each elemental actually gives to know exactly what the benefits are. You know, fire elemental attacks are fire, and if anybody is, you know, walking through their path, they'd have to take fire damage. Water elementals, if I'm not mistaken, can uh, incorporate like enemies into their body and start drowning them. So each one are actually really strong, depending on what you need at a certain time. And as the capstone of this ability, you get 1,000 forms at 14th level. You have learned to use magic to alter your physical form in more subtle ways. You can cast the Alter Self spell at will. So, you know, getting the ability to, you know, Get a spell for free is always beneficial, but this isn't just like a oh you get this spell you can cast it uh you know a certain amount of times per day or you can cast it once per day you know without expending anything, but then you have to use something to send you know to spend it every time. No, this just allows you to cast alter self at will all you want, never having to worry about anything. And just because I can, I'm gonna show what the alter self spell does. Which, oh, it looks like naturally you don't learn Alter Self, which, eh, that's alright. But, you know, essentially it allows you to change what your appearance looks like in a more, in like a, a stronger version of what um, Disguise Self can do. There's other benefits to Alter, alter Self compared to Disguise Self, so it's definitely got its strong points and it's definitely got its weak points. If you're a really big fan of... You know, if you're, like, constantly wanting to go into different beast forms, and you want to get stronger beast forms, and then air elementals, and all, like, you know, different elemental type of things for transforming, and you're the, you know, you want to be the kind of uh, druid player who, like, actively is using their, uh, their beast shape or their wild shapes, then this one is definitely the one for you. Uh, if you want to be more of a spell slinger, then maybe not the most targeted one, but it still is actually a very useful and strong uh, druid subclass, because uh, Wild Shape being like one of the core things of the druid, the, the core thing of the druid technically, because you know, their second level ability is the Wild Shape, so getting to use them in a stronger and more beneficial way, rather than just like the occasional like smaller animal type of thing that you can turn into, getting like the bigger, stronger uh, beasts that you can t turn into, getting to become elementals, and then alter self as a capstone. Not exactly, you know, not the most cr like the craziest thing you can go for, but it's still actually a pretty cool thing. So, and as you can see, it's also a different like format of how this looks. I just want to know what this one, uh, how it would appear, and it, it definitely I kind of like how this looks, having like a very 
long stretch thing. You know, Paladin and the Warlock. I believe actually Paladin and uh, the Wizard will be the only one where by the time I get rid of both of these, I believe Wizard will then turn to Psycho and oh, and Render. But yeah, I was trying to get it to where everything would be in their own, you know, like have better uh, disappearance with this. So, yep. Next up is Circle of the Shepherd. At Circle of the Shepherd, second level, you'll get Speech of the Woods. You gain the ability to converse with beasts and many fey. You'll learn to speak, read, and write Sylvan. In addition, beasts can understand your speech, and you gain the ability to decipher their noises and emotions. Most beasts lack the intelligence to convey or understand sophisticated concepts, but a friendly beast could relay what it has seen or heard in the recent past. This ability doesn't grant you friendship with beasts, though you can't combine this ability with gifts that curry favor with them, as you would with any non-player character. So, getting the ability to get a another language is always a bit like a beneficial thing that, you know, doesn't always seem the most beneficial, like with Sylvan, you know, with like less common languages, but it'll be, you'd be surprised at how often, you know, a having a new language can actually kind of like come in handy at bizarre times, especially something like Sylvan, which is probably one of the more common, uncommon languages, like one of the more uh, common unique languages. Because, you know, compared to something like Primordial or Infernal, you'll probably be talking to a Fae or characters who know, you know, characters and creatures who know Sylvan more often than you'll be talking to somebody who is more of a, of old language or of demonic language, you know, of a demonic tongue. So getting to know Sylvan is very beneficial, and then also getting to communicate with Beast without having to use Beast speak is extremely strong. So if you can you know, become friendly with beasts, you'll be able to, you know, maybe get a lay of the land. You know, if you see, like, a friend, like, a little squirrel, you can kind of communicate with it and be like, hey, what's around here? And they can be like, oh, I saw a strange person run into these woods maybe 30 minutes ago, or there's a strange shack in the middle of the of the swamp. I believe a, a hag may live there, you know, and it's just, like, a little beneficial thing that you get. And it's just for free, as, like, like a, a nifty little thing. So, you also would get a you also get spirit totem, which will grant you one of three options that you can just place down, and you can call forth uh, nature spells to influence the world around you. As a bonus action, you can magically summon an incorporeal spirit to a point you can see within 60 feet of you. The spirit creature uh, creates an aura in a 30 foot radius around that point. It counts as neither a creature nor an object, though it has the special appearance of creature it represents. As a bonus action, you can move the spirit up to 60 feet to a point you can see. The spirit persists for one minute or until you're incapacitated. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until a short or long rest, and the effect depends on which one you summon. The Bear Spirit the bear spirit grants you and your allies its might and endurance. Each creature of your choice in the aura when the spirit appears gains temporary hit points equal to 5 plus a druid level. In addition, you and your allies gain advantage on strength checks and strength saving throws while in the in the aura. So this is definitely something that if you know you're going to have a, uh, you know, maybe something that's more of a grueling fight where there is, like, a lot of strength related things. This one is very beneficial, or if you want to kind of just bolster your allies a little bit more with a little bit of temporary hit points, if you don't have another way to give them. You know, if you do have something like, you know, somebody who can uh, give temporary hit points through Inspiring Leader, or something else that might be giving temporary hit points, then you probably won't be summoning the Bear Spirit quite as much, but this is certainly something that's actually fairly beneficial early game, because getting, you know, seven temporary hit points on your, you know, what you might be like the 20 range, you know, like the teens to 20s on hit points, so getting to gain an extra seven is pretty beneficial. You know, if you're wanting to late game, getting like 25 might not be quite as beneficial to use something that you only get once per short or long rest, you only get once per combat type of thing, but Still, you know, this can be used outside of combat to gain your strength checks and strength saving throws. So, you know, if you want to do this as a, uh, something like as you're climbing, you know, you place this down and then you can help get your advantage, you know, your you and your allies advantage on uh, athletics checks and stuff. Then this is something that is fairly helpful in that aspect. You can also summon a Hawk Spirit. The Hawk Spirit is a 
Consummate Hunter, aiding you and your allies with his keen sight. When a creature makes an attack roll against a target in the spirit's aura, you can use your reaction to gain to grant advantage to the attack roll. In addition, you and your allies have advantage on perception checks while in the aura. So this one is a little more not niche. It's it's helpful in the fact that it allows you to get uh, to as a reaction give advantage to allies, but it's using your reaction to gain to give advantage, which means only one person will be giving like getting advantage when you use this. So it's, you know, a little down on that because, you know, there might be something else you want to use your reaction with, but also being that you are a spellcaster, you know, using your uh, reaction to do, like, an attack of opportunity, if you're not a warcaster, then it might not be the most helpful thing to use it as a, you know, to use it in that aspect, solely for the fact that trying to use, like, your low damage that you can do with a physical attack other than Warcaster where you can use a spell. But getting to give your an ally advantage on their attack rule could make all the difference. And then this is once again one of those kind of outside of combat kind of beneficial ones because you can do a uh, you know if you're trying to look for somebody if you're trying to be stealthy yourself while trying to make observations or if you're you know, going down for a long rest or a short rest, and you real quick need to make a perception check before you go to bed, you can create your Hawk Spirit, gain advantage on the perception check, and then uh, it goes away. And lastly, you can summon the Unicorn Spirit. The Unicorn Spirit lends its protection to those nearby. You and your allies gain advantage on all ability checks made to detect creatures in the spirit's aura. In addition, if you cast a spell using a spell slot that destroys hit points to any creature inside or outside the aura, each creature of your choice in the aura also uh, regains hit points equal to your druid level. This one is uh, fairly beneficial, getting the ability to, if you know you're fighting against somebody who either can go invisible, or maybe they have, uh, you know, they can go invisible, or they have illusion or like illusion based things then this will allow you to help, you know, detect that they are invisible or detect which one is the real one out of all the, you know, clones and whatnot. And then also the fact that this is one of those kind of, like, helpful healing abilities where uh, if you're, you know, if you're going to be healing somebody, then this one is fairly beneficial. So you can put this down so that you can find the invisible person, and then whenever you're healing one person, you can heal everyone. Not too much, it'll be two hit points to start, 20 by the end, but, you know, just as, a, like, a free little thing that you can potentially do if you're using the Unicorn Spirit. And this is only if you cast a spell to heal, it isn't if anybody casts a spell, so this won't be if your cleric casts a spell to heal, this won't, uh, this, they don't get the, the benefit of that, only you healing people will get the We'll get the benefit of that. So, and at sixth level, you get Mighty Summoner. So, at sixth level, beast and fae that you conjure are more resilient than normal. Any beast or fae summoned or created by a spell that you cast gains the following benefits: the creature appears with more hit points than normal, two extra hit po uh, hit points per hit die it has. The damage from its natural weapons is considered magical for the purpose of overcoming immunity and resistance to non-magical attacks and weapons. So. This is definitely your your whole shtick as this uh, subclass is you're a summoner, you're a shepherd for uh, for things. So getting to summon the spirits, and then also, you know, you want to be summoning beast and fey and other things fairly often. Beast and fey, not really elementals in this one, but, you know, getting the ability to kind of summon like a, uh, you know, summon multiple pixies or something, and do pixie shenanigans, or you can do actual, like, serious things with them, and, uh, you know, run around and, you know, some kind of larger creatures, which will have, you know, be a bit harder because of this, and then if they don't already have, you know, magical-based uh, weaponry, then they'll become magical-based for overcoming the resistance immunity, so it's just, like, a little bit of a extra benefit on something that you're already going to be doing as a uh, druid. At 10th level, you become you get the Guardian Spirit. Beginning at 10th level, your Spirit Totem safeguards the beasts and fays that you call forth with your magic. When a beast or fae that you summon or created with a spell ends its turn in your Spirit Totem aura, that creature regains a number of hit points equal to half your druid level. So once again, this is something that's, you know, your, the whole shtick of this uh, subclass is that you want to be uh, using your Spirit Totems and to also be summoning a lot of beasts to kind of have... Uh, 
you know, more attacks and stronger things around with Mighty Summoner giving you some benefit there. And with uh, your ability to kind of like communicate with the beasts and uh, knowing that uh, knowing Sylvan to talk to the Fey creatures gives you a lot of benefit there. So that, you know, they can heal, they can get more hit points, they can do better damage. So you really are the summoner, like the circle of the moon was your, uh, is like the wild shape druid. Circle of the shepherd is the summoner, is the summoning, uh, druid. At least for bays and beasts and fey, summoning, you know, elementals won't get all these benefits, but, you know, when you summon a beast or a fey, you get, a uh, some pretty decent benefits for what they have. And at 14th level for the capstone, you get faithful summons. Starting at 14th level, the nature spirits you commune with protect you when you are most defenseless. If you are reduced to zero hit points or incapacitated against your will, you can immediately gain the benefits of conjure animals as if you were cast using a 9th level spell slot. If summon four beasts of your choice that are challenge rating 2 or lower, the conjured beasts appear within 20 feet of you. If they receive no commands from you, they protect you from harm and attack your foes. The spell lasts for one hour, requiring no concentration or until you dismiss it. No action required, and you can't use this again until you finish a long rest. So this is basically when you are knocked out, uh, rather than, you know, you will be knocked out. It isn't like the wildfire where you can sacrifice your summon to uh, to kind of come back as if like a phoenix in a sense. This is when you are knocked out. Uh, rather than kind of like being defenseless, you'll summon four level two or lower, uh, four challenge rating two or lower uh, beasts, four of them to disappear to kind of defend your body. And until you come back up, they will do nothing but uh, protect you. So they will make sure that you are not getting hit and they'll kind of attack whoever comes towards you. And then once you, you, uh, once you come back up, you can kind of, you know, uh, talk to them and use them as if you had summoned, you had used the conjure animals. The only difference is, is that a very strong thing is the fact that this requires no concentration, which means that you can technically summon a, you can technically do another spell that requires concentration while this is up. So you gain some bees to be on your team who will gain the benefit of Guardian Spirit and Mighty Summoner, and then you can, you know, do more things. Like, you can summon another set of, you know, conjure animals or conjure, you know, fey or conjure whatever to have a concentration spell up because it is a, this is not being used as a concentration spell. So it is a pretty powerful thing. Getting it once per long rest is, you know, it's just that kind of caveat that most of these uh, capstones have. It definitely is, like, I'm just going to put it behind, but... It is on par. It's the exact same style of thing as the Circle of the Moon Druid. It's just Circle of the Shepherd is summoning more things. Circle of the Moon is uh, focused towards yourself on your wild shape. This is for summons. Do you want to be a summoner or do you want to be a wild shape druid? That's kind of the, the only difference between these two is yourself uh, create is conjure. So it's which one do you want to do? Do you want to focus more on yourself or focus more on uh, summoning other things to help you out in that area? And lastly, we'll go over the Circle of Spores, granted by Magic the Gathering content for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Right off the bat, you get Circle of Spells, which is always helpful to see that you're getting some, uh, some spells for free. At second level, you're getting the Cantrip Chill Touch. And at third, you'll be getting blindness slash deafness and gentle repose. Fifth gives you animate dead and gaseous form. Seventh gives you blight and confusion. Ninth gives you cloud kill and contagion. So getting you know getting a cantrip is always kind of helpful. And rather than just something at third, fifth, seventh, and ninth, you're getting an extra thing right off the bat at second level. Getting chill touch as another cantrip, which you know getting cantrips is always extremely helpful because you get a very finite amount of cantrips and. Uh, once you choose a cantrip, that is all you get. You can't change them unless your DM allows you to change them through the optional feature manager. But usually it's you get a limited amount of cantrips, and once you choose it, that's it. So this just gives you another cantrip so that you can, uh, you know, if you're thinking, oh, should I have Chill Touch as one of my cantrips? Well, just hold off until second level because you'll get it for free if you choose the Circle of uh, Spores uh, subclass. 
Blindness and deafness is very beneficial. Anime dead and gaseous form, blight and confusion. Everything here is actually some pretty good spells in their own way, whether it's being utility based, whether it's being, uh, you know, anime dead is always fun to use, utility based, damage, damage type of stuff here and there. It's a, actually a pretty good list of uh, spells you get for free. Uh, you also, at second level, will get Halo of Spores. You are surrounded by invisible necrotic spores that are harmless until you unleash them on a creature nearby. When a creature you can see moves into a space within 10 feet of you, or starts its turn there, you can use your reaction to deal 1d4 necrotic damage to that creature unless it succeeds on a constitution saving throw against your spell save DC. The necrotic damage increases to 1d6 at 6th, 1d8 at 10th, and 1d10 at 14th. So just like a nifty little thing that you can do just to have a an extra little bit of damage potentially here and there. You know, it's not anything that is like game breaking and it's nothing that's like so weak and pathetic that you'll never use. This is something that can potentially, you know, help you out, especially early on where, you know, one D four necrotic damage just as a reaction, because it's not gonna be every time where you're gonna be able to use your reaction. So just getting to have a ten foot radius that you can use your reaction to real quick potentially get like a little you know a little pot shot of damage especially of necrotic which is fairly unresisted damage is is kind of nice to do and then later on 1d10 is kind of whatever but you know maybe you don't have something else to use your reaction on and you can kind of just pff, and just shoot off a little bit of spores to do it also at second level you get symbiotic entity you gain the ability to channel magic into your spores. As an action, you can uh, you can expend a use of your wild shape feature to awaken those spores. So rather than transforming into a beast form, and you gain four temporary hit points for each level you have in this class. While this feature is active, you gain the following benefits. When you deal your Halo of Spores damage, roll the die a second time and add it to the total. Halo of Spores is the other second level ability you get. Your melee weapon attacks deal an extra 1d6 necrotic damage to any target they hit. These benefits last for 10 minutes until you lose all temporary hit points or until you use your wild chip again. Rule tip, temporary hit points don't stack. That is a very like a very key thing. So if you're getting uh you know temporary hit points from something like uh inspiring leader, uh hero's feast, um something else that might be giving you temporary hit points in another way, uh these whatever it is, whatever your the second temporary hit point that you use, that one or you decide which one you keep. So usually it, you want to choose the the higher of the two. So that does mean that if you do this and then you gain temporary hit points from another way, these are, if you lose, you've lost these temporary hit points. So once you lose th all these temporary hit points, so that means that rather it's meaning that your temporary hit points go from, uh, what would it be, uh, gain four temporary hit points for a level, so you'd have eight temporary hit points. If you then, you know, you go down to zero temporary hit points and you lose all of them, you lose, you know, this type of stuff. Or that also means that if you go down to, like, two temporary hit points and then an ally makes it to where you have five temporary hit points, you lost these specific temporary hit points, which means that you lose this ability. Because it's not just saying any temporary hit points, it's these specific ones. So do, do watch out for that. That is the wording, so do uh, try to keep track of how that works. But uh, this is actually a, very, a pretty beneficial thing. It kind of helps you if you want to be a, like a little more uh, protected and a bit more offensive, in a sense, because this will allow your melee weapon attacks to deal an extra d6 of damage, and it also uh, gives you a bit of extra protection here with the fact that you can kind of run in and, you know, you have 8 temporary hit points here, and by the end you have 80 <laughs> temporary hit points from using this, which kind of at that point is basically saying, hey, why would I not use this? Because 80 temporary hit points is an absurd amount of protection. That nearly, that's over half of the, the HP that you realistically have. Because you're, you're going to be in the range of like the 120 to 140 range, usually depending on how much constitution you have. So getting the ability to kind of gain 80 temporary hit points on top of that and then getting these benefits of you know this and your halo of spores while this is active will do 2d4 2d6 2d8 and 2d10 while this is active 
it's actually a pretty helpful and kind of strong thing, and definitely not something that you should uh, you should gloss over when looking at the subclass's abilities. Uh, next up, at 6th level, you'll gain Fungal Infestation. Eurospores gain the ability to infest a corpse and animate it. If a beast or a humanoid that is small or medium dies within 10 feet of you, you can use your reaction to animate it, causing it to stand up immediately with one hit point. The creature uses the zombie stat block in the monster manual. It reanimates for one hour, after which it collapses and dies. In combat, the zombie's turn comes immediately after yours. It obeys your mental commands, and the only action it can take is the attack action, making one melee attack. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your Wisdom modifier, minimum of once, gaining all of it back at a long rest. So this is just another use of your, uh, of your reaction. If you don't want to be trying to do a little bit of damage, or if you did, you know, you had already, you know, rather than them entering it and you using your reaction to attack them, you can, you know, they can enter it and then you can kill them. And then as a reaction, you can bring them back to life for just, you know, an extra body on the field that you can. Uh, that can you can act kind of as like a meat shield in a sense for you to have a almost a distraction in a sense to help you not be attacked, and it also is another body to be able to do a little bit more damage. And it isn't you know anything like oh you have to use your action to have it do stuff or use your bonus action to do stuff. It's just all it can do is attack on its turn, which comes immediately after yours. So you can kind of just have a zombie on the field temporarily to kind of help soak up one hit because it only has one HP, but it kind of can run around and be a little bit of a distraction attacking people here and there. So, you know, if you don't have anything else to do as a reaction, which you often probably aren't going to have, like, just an absurd amount of miscellaneous things to be running around with a reaction for, this is actually a kind of neat little thing to do. Just like a little extra you know, thing to throw out there from time to time. Not something that you want to use every time, but something that can be used when it seems kind of beneficial. At 10th level, you'll get Spreading Spores. You gain the ability to seed an area with deadly spores. As a bonus, while your symbiotic entity is active, that's the level 2 uh, ability that gives you the temporary hit points, you can hurl sp uh, spores up to 30 feet away, where they swirl in a 10-foot cube for one minute. It's a, a somewhat decent distance, but then a 10-foot cube, not just a five, not just taking up one spot, it'll take up a 10-foot cube, which is a kind of decent size thing. And it's there for one minute. The spores disappear early if you use this feature again. If you just dismiss them, uh, if you dismiss them as a bonus action, or if your symbiotic entity feature is no longer active, whenever a creature moves into the cube or starts its turn there, the creature takes your halo of spores damage unless the creature succeeds on a constitution uh, constitution saving throw against your spell save DC. The creature can take this damage no more than once per turn. While the cube of spores persists, you can't use your halo of spores reaction. So this is basically using your halo of spores, and instead of using it as a reaction, you basically take the halo of spores and you put it to a different area, where instead of the 10-foot uh, thing circling around you, it's now a 10-foot thing circling around uh, the spot that you chose within 30 feet of you. And now that means that rather than when an enemy runs or runs into your 10-foot area, or starts in your 10-foot area, it is now this cube, which basically is just moving your ability, and it is no longer using your reaction to do the damage. It is just whenever they run into it or start their turn in it, they immediately will have to, uh, they immediately trigger the effect, which is kind of beneficial because now you can use your reaction for other things like attack of opportunity or for potentially for fungal infestation. And of course, this does mean that it is using your Halo of Spores ability, which will allow this to be doing double damage because it is using your. Halo of Spores ability. At least, that is how I'm going to interpret it as a DM. Another DM might say that, no, that is not, this is a separate ability. I, as a DM, am just seeing this as you're using Halo of Spores pointed to a different area rather than from you. So, before saying, oh, well, Cody says that this is Halo of Spores. No, I am counting it as Halo of Spores, just as how I interpret it. I will say that this is Halo of Spores. This is not Technically, Halo of Spores, though, so your DM may say, no, that's not how it works. But I am I am granting you that, uh, that benefit, in my opinion. And at 14th level, as the capstone, you get Fungal Body. 
the fungal spores in your body alter you. You can't be blinded, deaf, and frightened, or poisoned, and any critical hit against you counts as a normal hit instead, unless you're incapacitated. So, you know, getting the ability to resist blinded and deafened, that's kind of alright. It's not too often that something comes up that'll cause you to be blind or deafened, but being immune to frightened is, a uh, yeah, that's extremely beneficial, because that and Charmed are the two most common ones to happen. And you also can't be poisoned. It isn't saying that you're that anything about poison damage, but you cannot be affected by the condition, the poisoned condition. Not saying that you can't be, you know, affected by poison damage. Like if somebody uses, you know, poison spray or something like that to cause poison damage. Or, you know, you drink something that will that will do poison damage. You'll still take some like you'll still take the poison damage from that potion that you accidentally drank, but you won't be poisoned from it. And also any critical hit against you doesn't count. That's the overpowered ability right there. The ability to negate critical hits. The only things that really negate critical hits are the what we've been over at least would be the uh, Grave Cleric has a reaction that can negate a critical hit, and uh, Adamantium Armor can negate critical hits, but not everybody is going to be having Adamantium Armor, and I don't know if the Druid can would really be rocking Adamantium Armor, but now the Circle of the Spores does not have to, because at 14th level you're immune to critical hits as long as you're not incapacitated. So as long as you're still standing, though that critical hit against you, just tell your DM that doesn't count, because guess what? It doesn't. Which is extremely strong, and it honestly, like, everything so far has really, like, kind of been screaming, yeah, this is definitely B tier, you know, A tier, A tier, A tier, nope, S tier, for that last thing alone. Like, everything else could be just absolute dog water and kind of be, you know, trash, which none of it is. It's actually all, you know, pretty beneficial and actually kind of good in its own way. And especially because you get uh, circle spells, which not all of the subclasses get that. So getting circle spells is pretty strong. And then your what you can do as, you know, extra things to do with the reaction. The ability to basically what normally is a reaction can be put in a different area to kind of help, like, almost do crowd control in a sense. And kind of, like, quarantine an area almost. Or if you trapped in up somebody who is in like a, a box in a way, using like force cage or something, you can then just put this directly on top of them. So every time they start their turn in it, they're immediately taking a little bit of extra damage potentially if they fail the saving throw, which means that they're constantly having to make you know constitution saving throws, or they take some necrotic damage, which that's actually a pretty good thing to kind of be able to could like have an area be like hey you can't go over here or risk taking damage which you know it might not seem a lot right you know 2d10 or you know 2d8 at a time or even one die instead of two if your dm says that that's how they want to do it you know just having the ability to have that out there so anytime somebody is you know trying to do something with it boom an immediate like oh there's a little bit of a risk factor to try to run over here, or there's a risk factor to, you know, I don't want to run over here, take the damage from walking into the area. I don't have the movement to get out of the area. That means that I'm going to be taking two or four die worth of necrotic damage. Yeah, the enemy might not want to just, without, you know, potentially be taking that damage just because they're in an area. So it is a very strong ability to have that. And then the ability to uh, give yourself temporary hit points. And it isn't like, you know, a small amount of temporary hit points. Like 5 plus your druid level or, you know, 5, you know, plus, you know, so and so. No, it is 4 times your druid level. So it is a huge amount of temporary hit points that you're getting there. From 8 at the start all the way to 80 at the end. And then you're getting some decent benefits while in your circle of, uh, while in the, uh, that little ability, like the extra damage on melee attacks and the extra die when you're using a Halo of Sports ability. And then this at the end with your cap, capstone, that is one of the best capstones. Getting, a, you know, immunity to a couple of things and especially immunity to crits. Yeah, that is, 
something that is beyond. And also, reading it, it is the Spongle Force alter your body, and it is nothing here is saying while, um, like, none of it is saying while this is active. It's not saying while symbiotic entity is active. It is saying it is just while you're, in, uh, while you're awake, while you're not incapacitated, you're getting these benefits. It is not a, you know, de extra defensive measure while symbiotic entity is active. No, this is just something that is always active as long as you're, you know, conscious. So it is... It is very powerful and extremely beneficial to be choosing to have, like, you know, to have this allowed. So, this is definitely something that is great in any campaign, realistically. But, yeah, that'll do it for the Druid subclasses. Let me know what you guys think of the, how I, how I ranked them. If you guys, you know, if you vary and you think that... Maybe I should have put a different subclass in a different area. Then, of course, let me know in the comments below. You know, make your own tier list on the subclasses. There's plenty of subclasses to go about. And, you know, you've seen what every subclass up to this point is able to do. So you kind of have a somewhat informed decision. Remember, these are just my opinions and how I like to play the subclass. You know, if I were to choose the Druid class, you know, what I would choose as each subclass, what their benefits and the negatives are, and of course, remember the ranking is rank them against each other, and saying, you know, I'm saying that if you're going to pick the druid, the subclass needs to benefit the druid, not just, you know, if it's taking away from the class, then it goes lower, if it's adding to the class, then it goes higher, things like that is, you know, determining on the ranking, so... There's there's a couple of things that kind of go in, and remember, campaign also matters, because Circle of the Land can be extremely good, uh, or extremely bad. Because if you're in a dungeon, well, the Circle of the Land probably is going to do the most amount of things, but if you're in an environment where you're, you know, maybe in a jungle, or constantly going through a lot of, like, you know, miscellaneous things that have to do with what the Circle of the Land is good at, then yeah, obviously they're going to look way better than anything else. But, you know, if I put them in an area where they can't do too well again in, then yeah. But there aren't too many places that, you know, the legendary tiers, there's not a lot of areas where they're not going to be, you know, running through at the top of the list. So, but that'll do it for this video. If you guys you liked it then go ahead and hit the like button and comment down below what you guys like so I can continue doing it to continue making the videos as well as I have been. If you guys didn't like the video then go ahead and dislike it and comment down below what you didn't like so that I can improve upon it and make the videos better for y'all. If you guys want to know when I upload then the best way to know is by subscribing. But that does it for this video. Until next time, bye guys.